what we look forward to. So even if we have to delay things, we will have that uh, and celebrate uh, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're going to be talking today about the thief from John 13, and the thief may be a little different than what you're thinking, uh, but uh, hopefully uh, we will get this, this idea across that I want us to get across this morning. In John 13, we know that Jesus is about to go to the cross, and we may ask ourselves that question, why? Why would he go to the cross? Why would he have to go to the cross? And the answer to that is very simple. He goes to the cross because of God's love for us, and he goes to the cross because of our sin, my sin. You know, he went to the cross for my sin, and I believe, uh, not being God, but I believe that if I was the only one that needed that, that he would have gone to the cross for me. And I, I believe that with all my heart. Uh, him going to the cross shows the devotion that he had uh, to us, the love that he had for us, uh, and the mission that God had given him. We know that God had given him, him all authority to do all things, but yet because of the love that he had for the world, uh, he went to the cross uh, for us. He also knew that one that was with him, that had been with him, would betray him. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, it, it puzzles me to even think about the fact that anyone could be with him for that long and then betray him. But, you know, then I, I get to thinking of all the times in my life that I've betrayed him. Amen? Amen. I know you don't know about my life, but you can answer for your life. Uh, I suppose that all of us at times in our lives have betrayed him. And uh, this is something that, that maybe we can't even imagine what Jesus might have felt uh, from his uh, fleshly side, uh, becoming fully man but still fully God that we can't understand. But it might, must have hurt him very much. Uh, and we know that he could have called 12 legions of angels. I've been told that a legion of Roman soldiers was anywhere from 4,000 to 6,000. So if you take 12 of those, uh, you, you come up with a pretty good number of angels. And I, I really believe that the disciples at that time felt like he was going to call upon all these angels to help him. And with his power, he was going to overthrow the Roman rule that was there uh, of, of, amongst them and free them from that. Uh, so what would he do? I'm sure that this is what the disciples felt he was going to do. But instead, the Bible says he took a morsel of bread, dipped it, and gave it to Judas in a gesture of his friendship. You know, I'll be honest with you. If I knew that person right there was about to betray me and I was going to have to go to the cross for it and for something that I really didn't do, uh, I'm not totally sure. I hope and pray that I could, but I'm not totally sure I could be super kind to that person that had been with me for all those years, listening to me, watching me, uh, and then uh, betray me. So I want us today, knowing that that's who Jesus is today, someone that's there for us regardless of what we do or what we don't do, I want us to look at these verses, quite a few verses uh, but I want us to look at this uh, and ask ourselves some questions and look at a few, a few truths. So our, our, our verses are from John 13, 1 through 17. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And that means pretty much in, in perfection. He loved them in all ways. And supper being ended, the devil, having already put into it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray Jesus, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. That must have been something that was unbelievable for them. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? 
Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part in me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean, talking about salvation, and you are clean, but not all of you, <laughs> speaking of Judas. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? Do you know what I have done to you? I want to pause right there for just a moment. I had a lady at the church that I was in in Macon, and she came to me one Wednesday night, and she said, Brother Phil, you know I'm going to Mercy University. I said, yes, I know. And she said, uh, one of my professors in a religion class asked me why, if we believe the Bible, do we not continue to wash feet? I said, we do. And she said, well, I've been a member here a couple of years, and I'm here most every service, and I don't remember us washing any feet. I said, if you read that passage, you understand that this was a servant's uh, role to do this, but yet Jesus took it upon himself because none of the disciples would, would, would fit into that servant's role at that time and really, what he's saying is, he did it as an example of servanthood. And if we're not serving people all the time, we need to quit pretending to be Christians. So you go back and tell your professor that we wash feet every day out here at Lawrence Drive Baptist Church. She said, I don't know if I'm going to tell him that or not. I said, well, you don't have to, but he said we don't do it, but we do what Jesus asked. Jesus asked, I have no problem with washing feet. I can wash your feet if you need me to. Probably rather not, but I will. Uh, but that's not, that's not the point of this passage. The point of this passage is that it was a servant's role to do that. There was no servant present. The disciples decided they were too good to do that, so they didn't step up and volunteer, so Jesus did it. And understand, back then, they wore sandals, or probably some of them barefooted. They didn't have paved roads, so they were dusty in the summertime, or in the last few weeks here, they would have been very muddy. So when a person went on a journey across town, up the road, from one village to another, their feet got dirty, and they had servants, and they would wash and clean their feet, maybe to keep them from tracking up in the house, maybe just to make them clean. But the main point is, Jesus showed a servant's heart of serving them. And that's the key to our, our passage. Jesus said in verse 13, You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have, give, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Loving, humility, servanthood. Verse 16, Most assuredly I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, he said, blessed are you if you do them. I'm a blessed man. I love the Lord. I try to be obedient to him. He gives me joy unspeakable. He gives me peace that I can't even express to you. And he gives me the hope that only he can give. I pray today that these words would sink deep within us and we would understand the true meaning of them. Jesus and his disciples would have been reclining at the table. As I said, normally a servant would have come to wash their feet. Uh, maybe Jesus was watching, waiting to see if Brother Antoine was going to wash someone's feet, if I was going to wash someone's feet, 
If Diana was going to wash someone's feet, Brother Larry, Brother CJ, or who was going to do the foot washing? None of the disciples, it appears, stepped forward to wash the feet. So Jesus took it upon himself to show them what they should be doing and to show us what we should be doing. Remember, also they would be arguing over who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God. Who would be able to sit on the right-hand side of Jesus? Who would be able to sit on the left-hand side of Jesus? Uh, from a human standpoint, it appears that the life of Jesus was one of constant humiliation. The religious leaders there never understood who he was, never wanted to understand who he was. His own people in his own town rejected him. The disciples would actually betray him as Judas did, not the same way. I'm, I, I don't, I'm not saying that, but they fled all but Peter, and we, we talk bad about Peter for him denying Jesus, but at least he was close enough around to see what was going on. And finally, the religious elite made sure that Jesus died on the cross, a humiliating cross for you, for you, for me, for anyone in prison for the most horrible crimes that ever been committed, for anyone that we couldn't even imagine might come to, to saving faith in Christ. Christ died for everyone. Amen? That's what Easter is all about. Isaiah said this, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Although we may see and others may see Jesus' life as one of humiliation, Jesus saw it as his mission. Amen? And that's what I want to talk about, two things today. First of all is our mission. Our mission, my mission, your mission. Anyone that claims the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we have a mission, and our mission is to complete the mission that he came for. He came to, to, to carry out the good news, and we're to spread that good news to those people who are around us. He was the Son of God, divine, uh, but our example, and this humiliating experience that he went through of washing feet, uh, I hope and pray was an example to them that day. He told them, this is an example for you, and I hope and pray that it was, and it should be something that we should learn from. Uh, they, I believe, had exaggerated ideas of their importance. Exaggerated ideas of their importance. Here they were, traveling with the Son of God, watching him as he healed the sick, gave sight to the blind, uh, brought people into the kingdom of God, ate with sinners, and told them their sins were forgiven. I can understand how they might have had an exaggerated idea of their importance. Now think about us. You know, how often do I look around and see people doing things that are terrible. Uh, it happens every day, it seems now, does it not? And, and, and it gets into my mind, and, and Kat and I may talk about it more times than, than, than not talk about it. How, how can a person do the things to other people that they do? And, and it, 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 if we're not careful, it can give us an exaggerated idea of our importance. Amen? I, I don't know about you, but sometimes uh, it gets in my mind that I may be better than them. It gets in my mind that I would never do some of the things that they've done. It may get in my mind that, you know, these people could do better if they would just try. And I can get an exaggerated idea of my importance in this world and to God. 
But we have to understand that every person that's ever lived committed sin. The Bible says we're born with that sin nature within us. And we love to categorize sin. Uh, my sin, if I were to steal from uh, some organization I worked for, I wouldn't think my sin was near as bad as somebody that killed somebody. Because I would be thinking, these people have got a whole lot more money than I have. They're not going to miss a couple of hundred dollars, but I could really use it, you know? And I may think to myself, I am not near as bad as they are. But you see, sin is sin. And if I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. And the Bible says I'm a sinner. So we have to be careful not to get that exaggerated idea of our importance to God. How easy we can fall prey to pride. Amen? And make no mistake about it, pride is the thief that I'm talking about today. Yes, I know Satan is the thief. Satan robs and steals and destroys. I know what the verse said that we read earlier. But I believe he uses pride in the church more than anything else. Uh, with all the things that we do, we wonder sometimes, why couldn't I be doing that? We wonder, why wasn't I asked to do that? We, we wonder, why, why does this person get to do this and I don't get to do it? I could do it a whole lot better than that person. And I talked the other night about the, 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 what Jesus told uh, in the Bible. And he said, don't come and sit down front in the places of prominence and then have the host of the place to come and say, hey, I'm sorry. But, you know, this is not your spot. This is old Joe's spot. Your spot's back in the back. He said it's much better to get in the back and then have someone to come and bring you to the front. I'll never forget, I went to a funeral. Uh, Betty Kim, many of you remember Betty. Uh, she comes by the office every now and then. Uh, I went to her uncle's funeral over in Roberta. I was sitting back in the back and uh, was there out of respect for her and to be with her. And she came in, they were marching in the family, and she looked over and saw me, Brother Antoine, and she said, oh, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. Y'all get my pastor up there with the rest of those pastors. Don't have him sitting back there in the back. I said, Betty, I'm okay back here. She said, no, you're not. I want you up there with the rest of the pastors. I figured I was gonna be speaking too, but I didn't, didn't that day, but I have had to sometimes when they did that for me. But she, what she was saying was, my pastor don't need to be sitting back in the back. I was fine, but she wanted me up front. So sometimes we can get an exaggerated opinion of our importance. We need to always remember Philippians 2, 5 through 11, where we find these words. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Can you imagine that? Having a mind that's the same as that of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, servanthood, who being in the form of God, the essential essence of God, did not consider it to be robbery to be equal with God, but he gave up that position for a while, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of the man, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, because of his obedience, God has also exalted him and given him the name above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven, on earth, and those under the earth, all of the universe. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now or then, we acknowledge that he is God. In our mission, John 20, 21, Jesus said to them again, he'd already told them in John 14, peace be to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. So our mission is his mission. Amen? Amen. To pray for the sick, to help the brokenhearted, to help those that are hurting, open the eyes of the spiritually blind, 
and in all of these things profess the name of Jesus and the good news that goes along with that. One last thing. I, I just called it our proof. Our proof. In other words, how do we show those around us that we have a mission to carry out? And that mission would be that of the, uh, the same as Jesus. Jesus actually answered that for us in John 13, 34 through 35. He said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. And that's the key, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. In John 15, 12 through 13, this is my commandment, Jesus said, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Our question today is, are we laying down our lives for those people around us? Even those that we may not like. We've got to love them as a good Christian, amen? We've got to love them as a good Christian, but we may not like them. But would we lay down our life for people around us that need us. The thief that we're talking about today steals our joy, amen, breaks up our fellowship in churches and tarnishes, if not destroys, our witness to people around us. Pride. We measure our churches with many yardsticks, don't we? Statistics, organizations, numbers, baptisms, so forth and so on. But what is the measure of love that we have for other people? Don't let the thief of pride take away your love. I think that's what Easter is all about, you know? Jesus exhibited the very opposite of pride when he came from heaven and gave his life for us. Love of God, our love for others. You remember Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like unto it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. On this he says, all the commandments and prophets hang. You know, everything, everything hangs on our love of God and our love for other people. That's what Easter to me is all about. And I hope and pray that it's all about it for you. Pride can st strip away our love for others. Can it? And it can make us think we're somebody we're not. And I think the Bible might say that pride comes before destruction, the fall and so forth, whichever version you read it in. In other words, pride leads to bad things. Amen? Amen. Father, we love you.